Just lift your heart with your hand to the Lord right now. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Is here. Is here. Is here. And I receive it. 
are my healer, oh God. You are my Savior, oh God. We love you today, Jesus. Right in your home, would you do that? Would you lift your hands toward the heavens? Lift your eyes to the hills. Lift your eyes toward the heavens and tell the Lord, you are my protector. You are my healer. You are my provider. You are my Savior. You are everything, oh God. We love you today, Jesus. Come on, just take a moment and love him. We love you and we worship you and we praise you, God, for your mighty hand. Your mighty works, oh God, we love you today. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. God bless you and thank you. Thank you for joining us today, the Anchor Church by way of the web, whether through, whether through our website, theanchor.church, or by Facebook Live. We're so glad that you've joined today. I know right now, with an empty building, we still feel the presence of God because we don't come to entertain a crowd that shows up. We come to entertain God. So no matter where we are, whether in His sanctuary or in the firmament of His power, that means the space outside of a building, God is still God and He's worthy to be praised. He really is. He's worthy to be praised. Psalms 32 Chapter 32, verse 6. Let me give some instruction here to every family tuning in. I just want to remind you that the importance of devotion, the importance of moments like this, is to be prepared for. For one thing, that you want to encourage your children not to be laying down on the couch, uh, but, but to be up and observing, especially our teenagers. I know children, it is what it is, but, but uh, to be observant to be respectful, uh, not to be playing a video game or watching something else or doing their homework or whatever it might be, but for this period of time, to have total focus. The Bible says to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, I believe with all your mind and your might. But right now, if you would just not think about tomorrow, not think about yesterday, but right now just focusing our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. Worshiping Him, amen, in songs we have. Worshiping Him now in word. I want to remind you that you can still worship in giving. How do you do that? We do that every Sunday. You can do that by, by uh, writing your check and sending it to the church tomorrow or stopping by. Or you can do that by on, on, through online giving. And so we don't want to stop anything that we do. Worship, prayer, loving, reaching. At any point, we want to remain who we are and that is faithful to God as he has been faithful to us. And you can say amen. The book of Psalms chapter 32, so overwhelmed by the presence of God. Moments like this, it makes it even sweeter to know that God is for us and God is with us. It says in verse 6, it says, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. He said, Thou, speaking of God, art my hiding place. Where do we go in times of trouble? That old song says, I go to the rock of my salvation. I go to the stone that the builder rejected. I run to the mountains and the mountains stand by me. When all around me, when the earth all around me is seeking sand, Christ, the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter and when I need a friend, I can go to the rock. Today I'd like to preach to you on simply God is my refuge. Would you invite God into your home? right now. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for our instruction. Your word never changes in a time of crisis. Your word remains the same. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Amen. God bless you. I'll never forget the story of a national day of prayer that was going on in Washington, D.C., 
at the, at the steps of our White House and different ministers from around the country specially chosen to be there to speak and one after another would get up as one would talk about how our nation was in trouble. One would get up and talk about our teenagers are in trouble. Another one would get up and talk about how we need to pray because the marriages are in trouble. Some might have even talked about the economy being in trouble. It was one preacher after another that was talking about an America that was in trouble. But they said there was a little bit of a shorter statured preacher and he was a black man and he got up and he made the statement. He said, I realize that today the only thing we've heard is how our nation is in trouble and our youth are in trouble and the American family is in trouble. He said, but I come to tell you today that God is not in trouble. God's not in trouble. God's on the throne. He's not caught by surprise. He's not working nervously, walking nervously and wringing his hands saying, what am I going to do? Oh, no, not the God I serve. God is in control. And that same God that's in control, he's one prayer away from you. Amen. That can preserve you. He can protect you. And as we heard sung just, just a moment ago, he's a God that can heal you. When I think of God, I think of a personal God that, that talks with me and speaks with me. But I also think of his majesty. A few, uh, and I'm going to talk about creation in just a moment, but there was a uh, several years ago, I went to see my friend, Pastor Matthew Tuttle in Holland when he was a missionary there. He took me to Corey Ten Boom's house. Corey Ten Boom, who was a Christian lady famous for hiding the Jewish people during the Holocaust in her country. I actually went into her home, and you can see online the picture where I was standing inside the hiding place. It is called the hiding place. She has a book called the hiding place. But I was there. There is a shelf on one side and there's there's towel racks and things like that. It, 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 it's a facade wall. It was built brick. And you would go through the bottom of the closet and there was a, a spot about, really just about that wide. And she would hide up to nine people at a time. It was too small to kneel. They had to stand. But this lady uh, protected hundreds of people until she could find them an escape route to get out during the Holocaust and the trouble. She was not a Jew, but she, she was a Christian. She and her father strongly believed in the protecting of the Jewish people. We still believe that today. We still believe we ought to protect uh, Israel because of his covenant and his promise to Abraham. But she did that, and it was called the hiding place. I just want you to know today there is a place that you can go to. It might not be behind the closet wall and uh, uh, and, and, and a sense of uh, preservation that way, but his presence is a hiding place. We can go there. The Bible says that God is my refuge. He really is. The scripture also tells us that the name of the Lord in Proverbs is a strong tower and the righteous can run into it and be saved. Why don't you just say this at home right now? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. When you say the name of Jesus, it becomes a place for you to go to. I'll never forget driving home one late night with my wife, Cindy. We are on Route 93 going south, getting ready to turn onto our road. We are sitting there and... Uh, complete stop. There was more traffic than usual coming northbound lane. And uh, I'll never forget, I looked in my rear view mirror. Now you have to understand, I'm a little nervous because I've been rear-ended four times in Zanesville. Four times. And uh, I looked in my rear view mirror because of the uh, nervousness from previous accidents. And I looked, and sure enough, Someone is coming at me at full speed, which is 55 miles an hour, maybe even going faster, it appeared. And I looked up, and I saw this car in my rearview mirror. I can see it coming toward us. They do not even see that we are stopped. They must have been on their phone or something, as people do nowadays. And I remember when I looked, and I gasped, for <gasps> just like this, that my wife screamed, Jesus! And in an instant, I saw it. When she said, Jesus, the car immediately went like this. 
slid past us, thrown gravel upon the road, but the name of the Lord protected us. I'm telling you today that you can call on his name. The Bible says, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Another verse says, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Jesus went on to say in John 14, whatsoever you ask in my name, he said, I will do it. What is the name of the Lord? It's Jesus. Zechariah said, in that day there should be one Lord and his name shall be one. Another verse tells us that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord. He was known by many titles in the Old Testament. He was also known by titles in the New Testament. We know him as Father. We know him as Holy Spirit. We know him as Son. In the Old Testament, we knew him as Jehovah, Yahweh, El Shaddai. We knew him as El. We see those words in scripture through the old language. But one thing we know today, he has many titles, but he's got one name. And that name is Jesus. That's why when they prayed, they would say, Oh, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on us. You would see people, people say things like, Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't just another name. It was a name. The Bible tells us that he has a name that is above every name. Oh, yes, he does. He has a name. Oh, I get happy when I'm preaching. Oh, there's nothing like good news in moments like this because God doesn't waver. He really doesn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says that he has a name that is above every name. He has a name above every name. I realize in Mexico there might be a Jesus. Somewhere else in another country they might have a name Jesus, but this name is specific. Yes, other people might bear the name on their birth certificate. When you say the name of Jesus, calling on the name of God, there's something that happens. It's more than just calling on your father. It's more than just calling on your mother or your spouse or the doctor. When you are calling on the name of God and you say the name of Jesus, something really does happen. Why don't you do it in your home? Maybe you're driving down the road. Maybe you're at the hospital right now. You say Jesus and I promise you, you're going to feel the glory of God come over your family, feel the glory of God coming over your life oh somebody say Jesus oh say Jesus you ought to teach your children to pray Jesus you do everything you do that's why in the scripture everything they did they would do in the name in the name in the name in the name of Jesus we baptize in the name of Jesus and that's why because every single person that was baptized in the name they were baptized in the name that had died for them it's amazing how uh Sometimes arrogant we can be as people. Uh, you look at that and you see it in the, in the New Testament as well. They begin to boast on who baptized them. Such as one would say, I was baptized by Paul. Another one would say, well, I was baptized by Apollos. As if the person baptizing you brought greater validation to your baptism. Isn't that something? To think that we could give credit to a man for your salvation according to who it was that spoke over you in baptism or who it was that took you down in the water. I want you to know today that it's not who baptizes you that remits your sin. I want you to understand today it's not who speaks over you that really matters. It is the name that is invoked over you that matters. Paul said it this way. He said, he said why does it matter? on who baptized you. He said, Paul said, I didn't die for you. Apollos didn't die for you. What he was saying was, it doesn't matter who baptizes you. It matters who the one is that died for you and the name of the one who is spoken over you is the one who died for you. Paul said, I wasn't crucified. Apollos wasn't crucified. What he was saying was, we baptize in the name of the one who died for us at Calvary. And who was that? Oh, his name was Jesus. The angel told, told Joseph, says, She shall conceive, speaking of Mary, and she shall bring forth the son, and thou shalt call his name, the angel declared his name, Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What's the name of the Father? John 5, 43, Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name. That's right. Look at Luke 24. Look what it says in verse 47. And that repentance... And remission of sins, Jesus said, should be preached in 
His name. He said remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's right. Jesus said in His name. What name was used in Jerusalem? Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Let's look and see what it says. Very powerful. Go ahead. You can turn there. I recommend while we're doing Bible study, while we're preaching, you take your Bible out. Maybe you got it on your phone. Maybe on a device. That's all right. But Acts chapter 2, verse 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, look at it. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. How? Or who? Every one of you. Not some of you, some people teach, but every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins. If someone said anything else over you, they baptize you, just say, oh, we baptize you in the Lord. We baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, listen, you want to do it the way they did it, beginning at Jerusalem and through the book of Acts. Someone once said to me, well, Jesus said in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name. That, that's where people miss it. It didn't say names. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What is that name? That singular name. Study it. Break it down. Diagram the sentence. You're going to still come out with that there's one name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That's right. John 14, 26. The Bible says the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. There's one name. That name is Jesus. And I come to declare to you that when you say the name of Jesus, there is something powerful that happens every time. I believe when we baptize in the name of Jesus, that remission of sins. Let's stop here for a minute. Flip your page over to Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. This, this, this is Paul, the apostle, who wrote most of the books of the New Testament, the epistles or letters. This is what was said to him. This is what Ananias said to him when he came to be converted. He had been blinded. God blinded him to, to lead him to the preacher uh, because he was very passionate about the Jewish law. He was persecuting the church. But Paul wasn't saved. And God revealed to him who he was on that day. And he said, I am Jesus, he told Paul, who was formerly Saul, the persecutor of the church. But God changed his name. And uh, watch what happens. In Acts 22, this is a recount of Paul's conversion. In verse 16, the preacher said, Why tarriest thou? That's an old king's language, but that, that simply means why wait? Arise and be what? Baptized and wash away thy sins. How? Calling on the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? Again, Zechariah 14 says there's one Lord, and in that day his name shall be one. That's right. Scripture also tells us there's one Lord, there's one faith, and there is one baptism. You, you don't want to miss it. You want to make sure you're right with God in every sense of the word. But I've had people come and say, but you know, I was sprinkled. I had, I had water sprinkled over me. That's nowhere in the Bible. That, that is a tradition of man. The word baptism, baptismos, actually means to be submerged. I, I really am serious about this. I have rebaptized people because their hand was stuck out of the water. Because submerged means to go all the way under. Hey, if we went to the graveyard, Romans 6 says we are buried with him by baptism, and somebody's, we buried a dead man, his hand was stuck up out of the ground, I think we'd probably redo it. You, you Go bury them. Go all the way under. That's what it means. That's what it means. And in the name of Jesus. Why? Because everything you have, you can take to his name and put it in him. Remember this. He didn't only die, he was buried. They hewn the place out the stone they called it a sepulcher in the, in the cliff of the rock they put him in there oh yes they did they buried him put a stone over that soldier on each side to guard the stone to make sure no one would get the body of Jesus but on that resurrection morning three days after he died we call it Easter resurrection Sunday we celebrate but let me tell you something that happened on that day the angels rolled the stone away and Jesus came out of that grave alive forevermore. Aren't you glad you serve a Jesus that is not dead, that, that death couldn't hold him, the wounds of men could not keep him, he didn't hold grudges, no, he's alive today. 
He's alive in my heart, and he can be alive in your heart today. Thank him right now. Won't you just take a moment and thank him for his resurrection power? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. This same Jesus that died, he was buried, and he was resurrected. He told us, except you take up your cross, except you deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, you shall not be mine. What was he saying? That he said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There's a moment in our lives we say, I don't want to be ungodly. We know when we are. Something moves over us in the preaching of the word. We say, I've been a liar. I've been a cheater. I have said things I shouldn't have said. I've got secrets in my life. The old timers would call it skeletons in your closet. You say, I'm tired of holding that. I had a man one time that came to this church. He told me, he said, he knocked on the door, didn't even have an appointment. His name was Tom. Tom came to the church and knocked on the door and we answered and he said, Preacher, I've met you in town and I've seen you, seen you around a few times. He said, I was in prayer. He said, I've been a Christian for 15 years. That's what he said, 15 years. And he said, I felt like I have, I have drugged my past for 15 years. Although I have felt forgiven, I felt like it was still hanging on. He said, I was in prayer and I felt directed that God said to come to you, you have the answer. I said, I do have the answer. Because the Bible doesn't just say repent. It says to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission. That means to remove. That, that means to be treated as if it never happened. That means all evidence of your sin is gone. Wouldn't that be nice? And for those watching would say that have been baptized, you know what it's like. You felt the burden lift. I have baptized people, they said, it just felt like a weight lifted from me. It, it just felt like my everything moved out of my I was so heavy, but I feel so light now. Why? Because that old guilt and all the things you've done, the things your soul knows that you've tried to forgive, it's gone. He makes the record clear. He washes all your sins as white as snow. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, he says it this way. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What is he saying? He's saying the stains you could not get out of your garment. He said, when I wash you with my blood, I'm going to make it as if you never had a mistake. You never had the spill. You never had the problem. And God has done that for me. He's done it for many viewers today. And he will also do it for you. Amen. Amen. Remission. That means to be treated as if it never happened. You can bury your sins in him and come out clean and ever made whole. As he was buried, we, we repent. Or excuse me, as he died, we repent. As he was buried, we're baptized. As he resurrected, the Bible says in Romans 6, 4, we arise to walk in newness, newness of life. God wants to give you a new day, a new way, and a new life. I'm going to say it again. God wants to give you a new day, a new way, and a new life. Turn from your sin. It's the best thing you ever do. Amen. There's a song we sing in church that says, Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever, ever done. Hey, that's the truth. Fall in love with him. Today, watch what God will do in your life. Who is He? John 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Watch this. Jesus was the Creator. That's what it's saying. You go to Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on to tell us in verse 13 and verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, we call it the sun. And the lesser light to rule the night, we call it the moon. He made the stars also. Look at this clip uh, that they just recently took of Saturn in, in the view of the moon. It, it, it's pretty awesome, really, when you look at it. You'll see Saturn is, is, is this, this planet that God created. They, with 
modern technology and telescopes, they're able to see these awesome events and, and all of these galaxies. And I don't want to bore you with science here for the moment, but let me tell you something. God is not down here confused. No, God sits above the heavens just like this. And if you can, I want you to take your hand just like that. And I want you to hold it down in front of you. I want you to hold it down in front of you. God can see the galaxy just like that. He's a big God. That's right. He's a big God. He's not, he's not locked in a corner somewhere. He sees the earth. He sees everything going on in the earth. That's right. While he's looking at Saturn, he can look at the earth. While he's looking at the U.S., he can see the drought, the unforeseeable future of the drought in Australia right now. They, they say, we don't know how it's even going to stop. Right now, while he sees Australia, he's also seeing the locusts right now in Africa. The pestilence upon the entire world, pretty much, with the coronavirus. God sees all of these events. See, we're not just one nation under God. We all belong to the Lord. All the way back from Adam and Eve, we are God's creation. People have strayed away. People go and serve other gods. They worship other things. They do their own things. But I'm going to tell you right now, we all still are the Lord's. Scripture says that we were made in His image. Every human being was made in His image. In God's mind, He doesn't love one skin color more than the other. One language or creed more than the other. No, He loves us all. For God so loved what? The world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm going to stop here for a moment and want you to understand. God sees the whole world at the same time. And he says, I'm just waiting on somebody to call on me. What's going to preserve in Goshen? He protected those his people from everything going on in Egypt. He protected them. He gave them a protective place. And what I'm saying to you right now is that God will give you a protecting place or a hiding place if you'll call on his name. He said, we have not because we ask not. We have not because we ask not. Let's look at Psalms chapter 121 and verse 1. And here's some verses. I want you to write these down. I want you to read them and study them during the week. I, I want to give you some hope and confidence today. Again, we're not having church today because we're fearful. We're having church. We're not having church today because we're careful. Uh, we're not going to tempt the Lord. We're not going to jump off the cliff or get close to the edge. And Satan told the Lord one time, he said, he said, cast yourself down. Let the angels take charge of you. I mean, it'd be dumb to jump off of a cliff because you're the son of God and everything's going to be all right. You don't have to worry. It doesn't work that way. He said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And I am encouraging every person to stay safe and to wash your hand. Try not to touch your eye, your mouth, and, and uh, or your nose. You, you, you got to be careful. And I'm just, we got to be wise. That's why we've shut down all church events, not because we're fearful. I want, you know, there's a difference between fearless and careless, isn't there? There, there really is. Fearless and careless. And we want to protect our community and our nation. That's why we're having a live stream only service today to bring protection. And I, I think also that, that really amazing is that I think we're learning right now God's not locked in these four walls. I think through tradition all the way down that we've handed down this concept that we only meet God on Sunday. We only meet God in the building. We reverence his house. And we believe that sanctuary but also firmament. You now have an opportunity to let God minister to you and you worship God right from your home. Many of your homes have been droughts. You know, they tell me that people are, uh, that there's a shortage of toilet paper and, and uh, all different types of products. And I've been to the grocery store trying to get different things. And the other day, I, there was no potatoes that were there. And uh, a couple of days later, our neighbor uh, brought us some potatoes. That was so kind of them, and I appreciated uh, the Eplers doing that for us. But you know what they're saying is because of all these empty shelves, they're saying, Quit hoarding food. That's what we're hearing. Quit hoarding it all. There's going to be people and seniors in need and, and things like that. Let me tell you what we've done. We might not as the anchor be in hoarding food, but I believe many people, Christians, have been hoarding the gospel. Oh, yeah, keeping it in the storehouse. I know it sounds like I'm wavering and wondering right now and off on a tangent. Not really. I'm going to get back to the point. But God never intended for the gospel to be hoarded among saved people. 
in a building and only discussed twice a week. It's just not the will of God. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. That's why he went everywhere to preach it because he believed that everybody deserved a chance to hear the good news that Jesus died, he was buried and resurrected, that they could repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus and fill with the Spirit. He, he gave his life to that. Let's no longer hoard the gospel. Let's share videos like today. Let's share and get people to watch because there's something that happens when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. Again, don't be, don't be careless and don't be fearful. Back on the scripture here today, what you will find is in Psalms 121, it says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Verse 1. It says, from whence cometh my hills. Help. Everybody say, my help. My help comes from where? Cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He's making a point here. He's saying, it's not just a little bitty God. He said, the one I'm calling on, when I call on the name of the Lord, my help comes from the Lord. I lift my eyes to the hills, which cometh my help. We sang today, I lift my eyes toward the heavens. What he was saying was this, is the God that's going to help me. He created the sun the moon, and the stars. Oh yeah, we see this in Jesus, don't we? Yeah, there's moments that he was hungry, but then he fed thousands. There was moments he was weak, but then he, he strengthened the sick little girl that, that, that was 12 years old, raised her up. Jesus, when there was a mighty storm and tempest, and they were fearful, what are we going to do? The boat's going to sink. And Jesus stepped on the bow of the ship and he said, Peace, be still. And the wind and the sea obeyed him. You know why? It wasn't the first time they heard his voice. It wasn't the first time they heard the voice of that creator. Because back at creation, the same voice, because the word was with God and the word was God. When he said, Let, he said peace be still, every, every bit of water, the wind, everything, just stop to obey him. You think God can stop everything going on right now? Yes. He can open the windows of heaven. He can stop the locusts. He can, he can do it all. But I'm going to know right, right now that maybe he's getting the attention of the earth. Maybe he's getting the attention of the church. Maybe right now he's allowing earthquakes in diverse places, the scripture says, to wake us up. That in the middle of it, what are we going to do? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're going to call on his name. And we can hide in his name. We can feel his presence in his name. In Psalms 121, I've been reading this. Watch what it says. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. It says in verse 7, look on down verse 7. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. I want you to say all evil. I pray in this church, I walk the perimeter of this sanctuary, this building, even the perimeter of this property, and there's three things I pray specifically and consistently. I say, God, I'm asking you to preserve, I'm asking you to protect, and I'm asking you to prosper the saints here. I do. I pray that consistently over and over again. Call your name out and pray for God to preserve, to protect, and to prosper. It says to preserve thee from all evil. He shall, what? Preserve my soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I have just, uh, uh, I'm going to close in just a minute here. But in Hebrews 6, I want, you to, I want you to follow along in this Bible study. Hebrews 6, verse 10, I want you to turn there. I want you to mark it in your Bible. I want you to be, get an understanding of what's going on in this scripture. You know, there's a lot of things changing in the world. We see in one moment what two weeks can do. I saw a statistic yesterday. A statistic yesterday that said, over 25,000 cases right now in the U.S. 25,000 cases. They're expecting that to climb. A lot of change. Economy plummet. The Dow plummet 10,000 points. I realize these are facts. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to say change has happened. We've had a lot of change. That's Sister Mary Williams in her mid-90s. And you know what she told me? She said, I've never seen anything like this. 
I'm 41. I've never seen anything like this. Change is upon us. What do you do when change happens? I'm going to tell you what to do. You understand that God doesn't change. Look at Hebrews 6, verse 10. Let's look and see what it says. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God's seen everything you've done, every prayer you've prayed, the faithful years that you've been in the house of God and toward the Lord. God has seen all of this. He hasn't forgotten your works. And we desire, verse 11, that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. What is he saying? That every saint, everybody, should hold on to the end and show faith and diligence and faithfulness. Even in moments like this, don't quit, don't be fearful. Pray, do your devotion. Stay tuned into your home church. If you're watching from around the world, and I realize we have people watching from around the world, we're glad you tu- you are tuned in today and pray God blesses you. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises. Verse 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, I want you to say God made a promise because he could swear by no greater He swear by himself. There is none greater than God. But he made a promise and he swear by himself. A God that doesn't change. Unwavering. Watch what it says. Saying surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. What it means is someone makes a promise and then they make an oath of that promise. They make a, this is what I'm going to do. Then they say, here's my oath. But watch what happens. It says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutable, immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Confirmed what? His promise by an oath. So there's two things, a promise and then there's an oath. It says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. He said, I will be with you even unto the end of the world, saith the Lord. He's not going anywhere out of your life. If you'll call on him, crisis might be going on, but it doesn't mean I'm not with him or he's not with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. Why? Thou art with me. If I'm in the crisis, if i got sickness, things are going on in my life, I don't have to fear because the Lord is here. The Lord is here. Read on, just a few more verses here. It says, We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope or this hope we have as an anchor of the soul I don't have to worry I don't have to fret I've got an unchangeable unmovable and immutable God that I can hold on to I want you to say right now if you're parents you have children I want you to say he's my anchor the Lord is the anchor of my soul both sure oh it's sure and it's steadfast The whole world can be changing, but God remains the same. I just want you to know, I've got a feeling everything is going to be all right. I do. I say it with such the anointing. I say it with peace of God. I say it as much as I've ever felt the presence of God. I say it with that. Is that this? Everything is going to be all right. Don't fret. Don't fear. Pray and believe for God's going to make it away. And which, watch this, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Amen. I want you to say, he's my refuge. God is my refuge. Lakin is going to come and sing an old song that my wife's and Sister Tackett's cousin wrote. Debbie Hare wrote a song called God is My Refuge. Janet Paschal sang it. She's going to sing that. Now, we're going to pray. I want you to bow your heads right now where you are. Let's pray. God, 
You have a name above every name. I can go to you when there's nowhere else to go. And I say the name of Jesus. There's something sweet about the name of Jesus. Sweet, beautiful, safe name of Jesus. Come on, would you do that? Would you just say Jesus? Jesus. There's something about the name. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. We go to you today. Every home, every person. Maybe you haven't prayed in years. Right now, pray. Bow your head. Just say Jesus. You don't have to be fancy. You've heard me preach today. I'm not fancy. But I'm just genuine with the Lord and real with Him. We love you today, God. You've got it all figured out. You're on the throne and in control. If you would like prayer today, Lakin's getting ready to sing. You can dial the number on the screen. 740-453-8620. There are people standing by right now ready ready to take your call. Maybe it's sickness. There's a young boy, two years old. I was messaged up for church. Caffrey, for the whitehead son from Louisiana, grandson from Louisiana. Very sick. We want to pray for him. Has been in a coma, two years old. We want to pray. Maybe you want salvation. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you're saying, hey, I'd like to know more about this end time and the coming of the Lord. I'm going to be teaching that on Wednesday. The coming of the Lord. I really am. This coming, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to teach on the coming of the Lord. What does it mean, the rapture? What I'm saying is, if you need prayer, you want a Bible study, you want to be saved, you want God to wash your sins away, you can call that number right now, 740-453-8620. To all the saints at the anchor, we love you. God bless you. I miss having church with you. It won't be long. We'll, we'll be back having church again. But until then, we're going to pray. We're going to love God. We're going to remain faithful. Lakin, at this time, would you lead us in that old song? God is my refuge. Cover over me. The storms of life toss me to and fro. There is a place that I can go. He's the shield.
Sing it like it. Thank you. 